Why do I hate this? There's a movie that just came out. You may have heard of it. It's called Wonka, as in Willy, How Willy Became Wonka, the origin story for the legendary chocolatier from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. What are you doing? I'm making chocolate, of course. How do you like it? Dark, white, nutty, absolutely insane. Could not hate it more. It's not that the movie doesn't look good. I mean, it doesn't. I have no interest in seeing this movie based on the trailer, but disinterest doesn't account for the hatred brewing in my heart for this film. The feeling of, I don't want to see this, does not necessitate, I am angry that this exists, although it seems like that would be news to some people based on the arguments I have been having all week about Wish. Those are different feelings. You can just calmly not want something, especially if you are not in the primary target audience. You haven't been harmed by its mere existence, just don't watch it. And I am forever skeptical of the idea that a piece of art you love can be retroactively ruined by low-quality additions to the franchise. Yeah, it's a bummer to see unnecessary, low-quality sequels or prequels for stuff I like, but sometimes that's just how the cookie crumbles, okay? And frankly, I think calling something unnecessary is a meaningless thing to say about art and entertainment. I believe that. I also think thing bad content is fun sometimes, good sometimes, but not something I want to build a platform on. And the only thing worse than a thing bad video is an I assume thing will be bad video. At least negative criticism about a work has value. Negative criticism based on the idea you made up about a work you haven't experienced does not even count as criticism. I have no interest in contributing to the current climate of movie discussion online where actually seeing the movie is completely superfluous to participating in the dialogue. I believe all of this, but I can't help it. I hear the phrase, how Willie became Wonka, and I feel flames on the side of my face. Is it just because it sounds dirty? Is it because Willie is not his name? His name is Willy Wonka. His William is not his first name. Have some decorum. Am I just grasping at straws to intellectualize my emotions, my instant dislike of a movie that ultimately isn't for me? Here's the thing. I have this same feeling about Cruella, which I also haven't seen, but I have heard really good things about. I've seen the clips on TikTok. It looks good. I've had it recommended to me. Still hate it. I want to see it, but I don't want it. I don't want it to be here. I have this unshakable sense that it shouldn't exist, even if it does happen to be a good movie. Why can I not deal with this? Why do I want this to be shot out of a cannon into the sun? Part one, what is my problem? This is wrong. They've done something wrong here. This is an art sin. There shouldn't be a tragic origin story for why the Grinch hates Christmas. I don't want to hear about Gaston having PTSD from the war. There should not be a movie about a young Dobie the Dwarf losing his ability to speak after witnessing the death of his mother, which is an actual storyline that was workshopped in the early 2000s for a now abandoned Seven Dwarfs movie, which doesn't have anything to do with what I'm talking about. I just needed you to know. Just read the card, you dopey dwarf. So let's play What Do These Things Have In Common? It took me kind of a while to identify the fact that I only feel this way about characters from children's media. And it took me a while to identify that because children's media is basically all I talk about or think about anymore. But I don't have this feeling of indignation about getting backstory or tragic origins for characters that are not from children's media. Even in young adult stories, I'm great with it. The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes was fantastic, beautifully enriches the original trilogy. I don't think adding detail and dimension to the story of Pres President Snow undermines his greatness as a villain in the original series. I think it enhances it. Give me your Better Call Sauls, your Mamma Mia prequels. Great idea. I mean, insane idea, but not any more than the original Mamma Mia was. House of the Dragon? Okay, not gonna lie, I am a little bit sore about that one, but for totally unrelated reasons, because I thought we were all on the same page after the ending of Game of Thrones, okay? I was hearing that we were done and never again would we be so betrayed and all that. I thought we had an understanding. I thought we weren't gonna watch this because fool me twice and all that. But apparently a lot of you recovered from season eight real quick because everybody watched this show. But besides my hurt feelings, frankly. I have no issue with this. The concept is great, okay? I love it. Give me more. This wouldn't be ruining anything, even if there were anything left to ruin. The Godfather Part Two, generally considered to be a pretty good movie. You heard it here first. I want to see Vito become the Godfather. I do not want to see Mufasa become the Lion King. These are not the same to me. So, okay, we've sort of narrowed it down to kid stuff. But it's not just any prequel to a kid's movie that I have an issue with. Did I need a backstory for Mike and Sully? 
No, but I don't begrudge Monsters University its fun. Sure, let's watch our pals meet and become friends. That's fun, even if it is not as good as the original. I don't have this I hate it reaction to getting more detail about the histories and the childhood of protagonists or side characters. Apparently, Puss in Boots is having prequel adventures in a TV show, and I'm glad Haley Whipjack watched it because I'm certainly not going to watch it, but go wild, puss, have fun. I don't mind Disney giving us Ariel's beginning. I don't need an explanation for how Ariel came to love music because that is not confusing as a character trait. But sure, let's have a little adventure and watch her blossom as a young musician and see the thriving artistic culture of Atlantica emerge. This is, I mean, it's not good, but it's fine. But this, this I don't like. This is the bad thing! This is the thing that is actively making the story worse. Somewhere in the chaos, Queen Athena, Athena. was lost to us. Oh, here at last is the heartbreaking real reason that King Triton hates and dislikes humans and the whole human world. No! What do you mean reason? The reason wasn't unknown. The reason doesn't exist. We were never missing the reason. King Triton's hatred of humans doesn't have a reason because it's not rational. It's not evidence-based. It's not fair. He's afraid of what he doesn't understand. In The Little Mermaid, Triton tells us why he doesn't want Ariel to have contact with humans. He's a human. You're a mermaid. He's a human. She's a mermaid. QED. End of proof. Look, if a prequel retroactively fudges some dates, changes some names, that sometimes that's how the cookie crumbles, okay? I'm not concerned that this is a plot hole because Ariel's mother is never mentioned in the original Little Mermaid movie. But it doesn't mess with the logistics of the plot details for King Triton to be given this baggage. It doesn't break the storyline, it breaks the character, which in my book is way more important. It breaks this moment when Triton allows his love for his daughter to overcome his prejudice. Is. This is a beautiful moment if Triton is setting aside fear and shame and overprotectiveness at last. It's not a beautiful moment if he's allowing his daughter to marry someone he thinks would murder her or her siblings. It's not beautiful if he arbitrarily decided that he's just done caring about his dead wife, who up until that moment had apparently been a major motivation for all of his actions and attitudes, and starting today just doesn't matter anymore. And it is not beautiful if he was was on any level correct to forbid contact with humans. Yet we know Eric is not a pirate and he would never hurt a mermaid, but Triton doesn't know that and he never learns that. We don't see him receiving new facts and adjusting his policies accordingly because that has nothing to do with the story. That is not what's being overcome. Ariel and her quest for a happy ending isn't up against a danger that Eric's community poses to her life. That was never the conflict. Triton isn't presenting one side of a valid argument. He doesn't represent all these good reasons that Ariel actually shouldn't be with Eric. King Triton is power in Ariel's world. He is unfair, unaccountable, unreasonable power. He has what feels like ultimate authority over Ariel in addition to literal magic that makes him unstoppable. And in The Little Mermaid, he's still plenty sympathetic. This character is not a monster. He's conflicted and we understand that deep down his fear comes from love. He's a decent person. He's just not right about this. When he changes his mind, that's a victory. The obstacle of Triton to Ariel's happily ever after was defeated with the power of love, just like the obstacle of Ursula was defeated with the power of sharp stick. This only works if Triton realizes he was just wrong. Otherwise, it's an entirely different story with an entirely different central conflict. Actually, it's potentially a more interesting story, at least a more complicated one with more mature themes and more realistic conflict, but it's not The Little Mermaid as it exists in this movie. If you mess with the backstory of Flounder the Fish, you've changed one character and their relationships and their attitudes. If you mess with the backstory of King Triton and alter his motivations and attitudes, you have messed with the fundamental cosmic powers that underlie the entire universe in which the story takes place. I think this is the difference. I'm not worried about any children's character being messed with. It's a certain kind of children's character. I'm not worried that more backstory and nuance will compromise Ariel or Flounder as characters. It 
might make things weird, but it might enhance them. But the more we dive into Triton's backstory, the more explanations we give for why he is the way he is in the main story, the more we undermine the role he plays in that main story. The more he's brought down to Earth, or down to the sea floor, I guess, which is fine for some characters, but not for a figure of ultimate unstoppable power. That's who I don't want to see origin stories for. I don't want to see backstories and prequels for adult characters from children's media, especially powerful adult characters. Often, this will mean the villains, but it's not just the villains. It's any of the larger-than-life figures that embody fundamental forces in the world. It's all of the adults, good guys or bad guys, with unimaginable power and knowledge and a motivation that simply can't be argued with. The Magician's Nephew is generally considered to be one of the best books in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia series, and it's a prequel. It takes place 40 or 1,000 years, depending on how you count, before for the events of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The book explains the origins of some of the strange and wonderful elements of Narnia, and this does include getting more backstory for some of the adult characters. We get to see the professor as a boy, we even see the character that comes to be known as the White Witch and learn how it is she got to be in Narnia. This is the kind of thing that makes me nervous. This is some thin ice. But you know what the magician's nephew doesn't have? Aslan as a lion cub competing in trials to earn his godlike powers? You don't see the White Witch minding her business and being bullied by a mean-talking badger, or having a traumatic Christmas in her childhood. None of that. When we meet these powerful, archetypal figures of good and evil in The Magician's Nephew, they are already fully formed. There are changes and events to come, but the characterization we get is totally in line with the characterization we see in the books that were previously published, and come chronologically later. It's unfortunately a little bit confusing that the Chronicles of Narnia are not in chronological order, but they're not. Stop trying to make them be in chronological order. They're not. Every time I see a box set in a bookstore that has resorted them in chronological order and has put the magician's nephew first with a big number one on it, God kicks a fawn. Yeah, art is subjective and there are no wrong answers except for this. This is wrong. This is the wrong way to read them. I know C.S. Lewis said you could read them that way. He was also wrong. Just because he wrote the books doesn't mean he knows best. That guy was wrong about a lot of other things. You should read the magician's nephew fourth. You should read The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe first. Obviously, how is that even a question? It will introduce you to the world of Narnia at a careful pace with the appropriate amount of childlike wonder. Then you go straight to Prince Caspian and do not pass go. Do not try to wedge the horse and his boy in there just because it chronologically takes place during the events of The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. That is the definition of true but not useful. You as the reader are invested in the Pevensey kids and their journey, so read Wardrobe and then Caspian and then Dawn Treader. Now we have the perfect time for a break from the A story to get some world building, some backstory, some weird stuff. Read Magician's Nephew fourth and The Horse and His Boy fifth. Then we can pick back up with the main England timeline for the last two books, which perfectly form a duology of The Ballad of Jill Pole, My Beloved. Silver Chair, then Last Battle, and you're done. We left my point behind a long time ago, but sometimes people are wrong and it needs to be addressed. So Magician's Nephew. The book tells us about the beginnings of Narnia and maneuvers some characters into the positions where we first meet them, but it's not an origin story for either of those two characters, Aslan or the White Witch. It doesn't explain them. The White Witch is in this different place and she looks a little different and she's this woman called Jadis, but she's still a witch. She's still a big bad. She's still evil. She's just somewhere else. There is no origin for her. There's no origin for the cosmological forces of light and darkness from which she sprang. The book might offer some backstory that's unexpected to you, but it never hits you with a grand reveal that you you foolish, naive reader were wrong to assume that you could take these characters at face value. Oh, maybe good and bad are more complicated than you thought. You didn't realize it, but they have secret pain. These stories aren't at war with each other. They are perfectly in line with each other thematically, and they take place in the same universe that has the same kinds of conflicts. The prequel just spends some time exploring the how of the setting of the first. These stories are at war with each other. They answer why instead of how, and why is just a bad question to ask about a children's story. I love the story of Peter Pan, and I'm always excited to see different people play in the sandbox of that mythology, but I have no interest in an explanation for why Peter Pan and Captain Hook are mortal enemies. Because what do you mean why? He's a pirate, and he's a lost boy. This is the way the world works! Why? I don't know. 
This is the definition of stuff that ain't broke. Nobody was wondering why these two hate each other. They just get it, and they get it down here. There is truth there. These kinds of fundamental conflicts ring true in children's stories because this is a child's world. This is a child's perspective on power in their world, which comes in the form of powerful adults. Before they can really understand systems of power, kids can understand individuals with power, and that power is total and inexplicable. This is your parents, your grandparents, your teacher, your coach, your whatever grown-up in your world gets to decide what you do and when you do it, even though you never agreed to that. When you're still young enough that the president has just been president as long as you can remember, even if you don't live in Russia, power is infinite in both directions. It always has been and it always will be. In a child's world, power is unfair and more importantly, unexplained. These characters that are larger-than-life figures that wield magic or influence that have all caps power, they accurately capture a child's perspective on power in their world. It intuitively makes sense to the kids reading or watching, and it makes sense to the adults, too, who are able to almost re-enter that childlike perspective when they see these characters. You don't get that experience, you don't access that truth if you pull these characters back down to Earth with explanations. Burdened with complex psychology and a tragic backstory, they're just guys. They're just guys. They might be cool or interesting guys, but they certainly don't embody phenomenal cosmic power, which is by definition unexplained. You can have explanations or you can have a legend. You can't have both. You can have the unstated myth of Han Solo, the coolest goddamn man you've ever heard of, who did the castle run in 11 parsecs, whatever that means. Or you can start explaining to us what a parsec is and why his name is Han Solo. I don't have people. I'm alone. Solo. We know why his name is Han Solo. I mean, look at him. Regular sized Rudy. Why do they call you that? Just look at me. I know dragging this movie is the lowest possible hanging fruit, but it is exactly what I'm talking about. Explanations are the enemy of awe. If you want awe, stop talking. We understand why Cruella de Vil is called Cruella de Vil. It's because she is this. Fifty giving us a literal explanation for why she hates Dalmatians in particular is not just unnecessary, it actively undermines this character as a villain. And maybe that's growth. Getting this backstory, realizing that heroes and monsters both have a history, have feelings and dreams, that's maturing. Eventually, you realize that your parents used to be kids like you. All the adults you see had to learn their skills and professions. They didn't just start out that way, and that means you're gonna grow too. And that's nice, I guess but I don't want that. Yeah, that's more mature, but sometimes I don't want to be mature. Sometimes I want to listen to Better Than Revenge with the original Mattress lyric. Many of the cheap heroes and villains tropes of days gone by are now rightly recognized as problematic. Good people are sexy, bad people have scars, and on paper, it's no bad thing to make goodies and baddies more complex than those labels traditionally allow. But now that every film and franchise features a tragic backstory to underpin villainy, this type of rating has become cliche and lazy in turn. That's Amelia Tate for Wired a couple years ago complaining about a lot of the same things I'm complaining about, but like most of the analysis of this trend I've seen, she focuses on the quality of the writing. She was specifically inspired to vent her frustrations with origin stories because of Home Sweet Home Alone, a Disney Plus original reboot of Home Alone, or sequel, I guess. I don't really know how to categorize the post-Macaulay Culkin Homes Alone because they are just the same concept done again. They don't seem to take place on the same time. Timeline? Anyway, apparently Home Sweet Home Alone decided to give really sympathetic motivations to the burglars, which frankly takes all the fun out of it. But I'd go a lot farther than this. It's not just that the writing is cliche and lazy, though it certainly is a lot of the time. I think this fixation on explicative backstories is actively making the stories worse. Yeah, complexity is real. Nuance is real. It is absolutely true that every seemingly larger-than-life figure has feelings and goals and history and reasons why they are the way that they are. But good and evil are real too. Hate is real. Love is real. That child's perspective that sees the enormity and terror of simple bad 
is true. And so is the awe and admiration that that perspective has for good, although that seems to be in less danger of revision right now. Given the current children's media landscape, I am wary of heroes being undermined, but I am way more concerned that villains are vanishing. Back in 2017, Lindsay Ellis worried that Disney villains were an endangered species, and she hadn't even seen Beauty and the Beast yet. I think we can probably safely assume that Gaston isn't going to get much of a makeover or a tragic backstory. This trend has only gotten more pronounced in the years since. When it comes specifically to Disney, not only are we rarely getting new villains, but the old ones are constantly going under the knife to get more understandable, sympathetic motivations. Looking outside of Disney, clear villains seem to be a little easier to come by, although they tend to come preloaded with tragic origins and understandable though misguided motivations. What happened to power for power's sake? Nobody's just out for ego, for money and fame. They come from the MCU school of villainy where they have to kind of have a point and defeating them is a sort of uncomfortable compromise. What happened to dragons? They're never just dragons anymore and you can never just stab them anymore. Fairy tales are more than true. Not because they tell us dragons exist, but because they tell us dragons can be beaten. You may have seen this quote as used by Neil Gaiman and it is actually not a real G.K. Chesterton quote which Gaiman will fully admit to. It is a more poetic distillation of the message of a longer passage from Tremendous Trifles where Chesterton is arguing against parents that are seeking to protect children from frightening stories. Fairy tales do not give the child the idea of the evil or the ugly. That is in the child already because it is in the world already. The baby has known the dragon intimately ever since he had an imagination. What the fairy tale provides for him is a Saint George to kill the dragon. Children deserve monsters. Give the children monsters. They deserve it, and I'm not afraid to say it. But they do. In their stories, okay, children deserve monsters in stories. They need heroes, and they need villains, which can't exist without each other. And you can take them out of the stories you give your child, but you can't take them away from the child. I'll tell you what hasn't declined over the last 10 years actual villains. We haven't put a stop to children knowing monsters and villains, we've just stopped depicting them. We have stopped meaningfully engaging with the monstrous in the media we give to children, which should be a safe place for children to spar with monsters before the real monsters come. This is bad. This is bad for kids. And not for nothing, it's bad for stories. It's boring and it's untrue. Well, I think that was pretty good. Yeah! That's a point, right? I think, I think that was a pretty good argument, right? Okay, so clearly I'm not a mindless hater. There is logic here. Really, it's it's for the children, okay? I'm, I'm just thinking about the children. Why would anybody think about the children? Yeah, that all sounded really good, but this is the part of the video where everything I've said so far might actually turn out to just be absolute nonsense. Because you know what doesn't make me mad? You know what I actually love? <laughs> Part two, Wicked. Wardrobe change, the top is from my grandma, and it's cold outside, so I put a sweater on my mic. Wicked is awesome and perfect and fun for the whole family, and it is exactly what I just spent 20 minutes saying that I hate. The Wicked Witch of the West is the definition of the larger-than-life monster of children's nightmares. She is the legendary villain, creepy and power-hungry and so intrinsically wicked that the wickedness has dried up the blood inside her veins. Arguably, she is an archetype as old as time, but her first appearance in this incarnation as the Wicked Witch of the West is in The Wonderful Wizard of Oz from the year 1900 by L. Frank Baum. And unlike most of the other characters Baum created for that story, she could be transplanted into any classic fairy tale and fit right in. Now, most people don't know the Wicked Witch as this, they know her better as this. In the 1939 movie, The Wizard of Oz, she is elevated to the position of primary antagonist and she gets a bunch of new cool powers and all of her iconic characteristics. This is your Margaret Hamilton cackling from her broomstick, green-skinned and long-nailed, traumatizing generations of children. The Wicked Witch is exactly the kind of fictional dragon that Chesterton was talking about. I should want Dorothy and her friends to slay the witch and move on, good triumphs over evil. According to everything I've said so far, this should be the last character I would ever want to be explained, to be given a tragic origin story or sympathetic motivations or complexity of any kind. But that's exactly what Wicked does, and I think Wicked is the best. Why different? I am not super sure, 
but let's throw some fettuccine at the wall and see what sticks. Now, when I say I love Wicked, the thing I'm referring to is the 2003 musical Wicked, but that musical is also based on a book also called Wicked. Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West by Gregory Maguire from 1995. The book is good too. It is really different. This is not a children's book. It is very distinctly an adult fantasy novel. I said before that I generally don't have a problem with prequels and origin stories outside of the context of children's media, so maybe this is the difference. The pure, delicious, simple evil of Margaret Hamilton and her cackle aren't being taken away from children. The Wicked Witch gets to stay untouched in the 1900 book and the 1939 movie, and then separate from those properties, adults get to revisit this childhood terror in an interesting new remix. And okay, that sounds like it could be plausible, but that's really only true for the book. And I'm not talking about how much I like the book, although it's good. I'm talking about how much I like the musical. Wicked isn't a children's show per se, but it's it's a mega musical. It's a pretty family-friendly, all-ages affair. Any performance of this show is going to have super fans in their 30s sitting next to grandparents taking children under 10, and they will all fit in. Partly, this just comes with the territory of the mega musical. As a medium, it is not going to have the kind of focused age demographics that like a book will have. It's naturally going to have a very wide appeal. But this also has to do with the way that they adapted the story. The musical significantly streamlines the story, which you really have to do to adapt into a musical. But the things that get left out from the book tend to be the more mature or potentially distressing plot lines. They end up with a very focused story, which centers on the relationship between Elphaba, which is the name of the Wicked Witch of the West character in this adaption, and Galinda later Glinda, the Good Witch of the North, another major player in the 1939 movie. If you have both read the book and seen the musical, one of the first things likely to jump out at you is how dramatically different the endings are, like many musicals before. McGuire told The Guardian in 2021 that at first he was a little aghast that they changed the ending, but he came around to it because he felt that the musical was still true to the themes of the book. Stephen understood what the book is about, identifying with someone who is ostracized. He knew I had not written Wicked to be a parody of the Wizard of Oz, but that I wanted to honor and unpack that story instead. So let's peel down that particular piece of pasta. It can't really be that Wicked gets a pass for having a different audience because the audience for the musical, in terms of age demographics, is basically the same as the audience for the movie. But there's something else interesting and kind of unique about Wicked as an adapted story. If you look back at the quote and the way that McGuire positions his story in relation to the original Oz story, he said he could have written a parody, but he actually wanted to honor it. And both of those relationships actually imply distance. He's responding to the Wizard of Oz. He's speaking back to it from the audience. He's not continuing it. Here's the thing. Wicked isn't a prequel in the same sense that Wonka or Cruella or the Puss in Boots show are prequels. It's a prequel in terms of its position chronologically, right? We're seeing the same characters and locations before the events of the original story. But a prequel or a sequel or a mid-quel, which is a word that we're all pretending exists, those are part of a series. Wicked is not part of the Oz book series. It's not an entry into an MGM Wizard of Oz film franchise. Wicked comes from a different source than Wonka, than Cruella. There's no reins being handed over. There's no baton being passed. This is an outsider coming in to play in this sandbox. I need Grammarly to start flagging it when I mix metaphors. But you know what I'm saying. The owners and creators of those previous works are not responsible for begetting Wicked. It is just a another work that fits into the grand American national epic that is the Tales of Oz. Having a shared sandbox of mythology, of characters and archetypes and events and locations that different creators would come in and make different kinds of art about, that used to be how all stories were told. But now, in our shiny modern world, it generally isn't possible for legal reasons. It is only possible in this case for Gregory Maguire to come in and play in this sandbox because the 1939 movie is, as I mentioned, based on a book from 1900. And because it's from 1900, it is public domain. Part 2B, surprise, this is about copyright law. Wonka is a Warner Brothers flick, but most of the examples I've mentioned so far are Disney properties. This is not surprising just considering what a large percentage of children's media is Disney, but it's also because Disney has a unique 
historically huge backlog of popular and iconic characters that they are constantly rebooting and remixing and remaking a zillion dollars with. They've always done this in different ways, but in the last 10 years or so in particular, Disney has been in a phase of going back to the wishing well of previous properties for remakes and sequels and, yes, prequels and origin stories. They've also found some other interesting ways of remixing famous characters and stories. The TV show Once Upon a Time aired on ABC, which is owned by Disney. This was a Disney project. The show claimed to be riffing on fairy tale characters. Every storybook character you've ever known is trapped between two worlds. Which is not untrue, but is less honest than saying they were riffing on Disney characters. Even though many of these characters were subversions of their standard fairy tale selves, they were still built on the visuals and characterization established in the Disney versions. The costumes, the story beats, they either literally were the Disney version or they used the Disney version as a springboard. Only Disney could do this. If anybody else tried, they would be sued into oblivion by Disney. Fairy tales are technically fair play for anybody. They're supposedly public domain. But while everyone is allowed to make their own Snow White or Beauty and the Beast or Cinderella, they are legally prohibited from using some of the best known elements. The elements that make up what many people consider to be the definitive version. The most well-known version of Cinderella is no longer the Brothers Grimm version or the Peral version. For general audiences today, the foundational Cinderella myth is Cinderella as told in the 19th 50 Disney version. There are lots of Cinderella's, but other versions are other versions. This is Cinderella. This is what Cinderella looks like, and these are the events that happen to her. This is also the case for the Wicked Witch of the West, who technically is a public domain character because she originates from the 1900 book The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, which is in the public domain. This character is fair and free to use, but this is not the character that anybody recognizes, right? They recognize Margaret Hamilton. The 1939 film is still under copyright. So anything new that they brought to the table that isn't in the original source material is potentially still protected. MGM doesn't own the name of Oz or the concept of the Emerald City because they didn't come up with those things. Those come straight from the book. They don't own the concept of the Wicked Witch of the West, but they do own the specific way they executed that concept. <laughs> I've actually seen The Wizard of Oz be brought up a lot in the conversations about copyright happening because on January 1st of this year, Mickey Mouse as Steamboat Willie entered the public domain. Copyright law is notoriously complicated and convoluted and difficult for the layman to understand. And frankly, I'm pretty sure a lot of it is thought up on the spot. So I would highly discourage you from getting information about copyright law from anybody but a literal expert in that field, including me. I'll drop links in the description to people who might be able to explain some things I can't. What I can tell you is that The Wizard of Oz gets brought up a lot as a recognizable example of a work where some elements are under copyright and some aren't. This pops up most often when it comes to the ruby slippers, which in the book are silver shoes, but those don't pop as well in Technicolor. So anybody can show Dorothy skipping down the yellow brick road, but if her shoes are red, you're going to be hearing from some lawyers. Disney actually finds itself on the other end of the seesaw on this one. Once Upon a Time actually did a whole Oz storyline, and it was terrible, and so was the makeup they put on Rebecca Mater. I have read, though I'm a little skeptical of this, that the makeup was so bad specifically because of copyright, because they had to work hard to avoid matching the exact tone of Margaret Hamilton's witch. So that's how you end up with this weird, shiny, greasy glass thing. The point is this. The world of Oz is a weird copyright minefield where some things are public domain, some things are very fiercely protected. And I don't know anything about copyright law that you can't learn from reading Wikipedia, but I'm pretty sure that Wicked is just copyright infringement that got in through a loophole. The musical Wicked is based on the 1939 film The Wizard of Oz. This might seem like a dumb and obvious thing to say, and it is obvious. Yes, we can all see this. We all know this is true, but we are pretending that it is not true so that nobody has to get sued. Gregory Maguire gets asked how he came up with the idea for Wicked all the time in interviews, even interviews that don't actually relate to Wicked. Everybody wants to hear this story, and he's told the story a bunch of different times in a bunch of different places, and he's got it down to a science because I'm sure that's what you have to do if you write a hit. Every time he tells the story, he is pretty clear that he was inspired by the movie The Wizard of Oz, not by the Oz books. I'm actually pretty sure when he first got the idea, he hadn't read the Oz books yet. The story always goes like this. And immediately, a vision of Margaret Hamilton arose up in front of me saying, I'll get you and your little dog. And I thought, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I've 
I've just had a vision, and it isn't the Virgin Mary coming down out of the clouds. It's Margaret Hamilton, and she has something to say to me, and I better pick up my pen and write it down. He's thinking about Margaret Hamilton's cackle. He's not thinking about an illustration he saw in a book when he was small. He's not thinking about words that came to life in his imagination. He's thinking specifically about this depiction, about the sight and the sound of this depiction in a way that can only exist in a filmed medium. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. <laughs> the Alphaba we see in the book Wicked is not the Wicked Witch of Baum's books. She is the Wicked Witch of the movie, complete with green skin, a flying broomstick, her cackle, her powerful, frightening magic. At its core, this is a book built on the characters and conflicts as seen in the 1939 movie. This is not a book you come up with if you are inspired solely by the books. Now, there's a lot more to this book than just Alphaba. This is a long novel with a lot of world building, and Gregory Maguire clearly went back to the Oz books and poured over them to fill out this world. We meet a lot of characters and see some elements of the world of Oz that come from later books in the Bomb series and do not appear in the movie. Legally, the official story, okay, the story that we're all telling the cops is that Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West, is based on the 1900s Oz books by L. Frank Baum. This makes it a cousin to the 1939 movie, or I guess technically a sibling. They have the same parent. There are lots of similarities because they are pulling from the same source material, and that source material is public domain, so everything's fine. Anybody can see that Maguire was definitely inspired by some choices made in the 39 movie, and there are some things that carry over, but nothing so substantial that it legally matters. The foundation of the story is rooted in those bomb books. Maguire builds this whole fleshed out fantasy world with so many different elements that come from the bomb books that don't even appear in the 39 movie. But that is not true for the musical Wicked. As I mentioned, the musical only translates a few specific plot lines from the book onto the stage. Those storylines are the things that come from the movie. The elements McGuire took from the 39 movie are only one part of the novel, but they're basically all of the story of the musical. And unlike McGuire's novel, the musical takes us back into a visual medium where the choices you make about the visual characteristics really, really matter. If the 39 Wizard of Oz film was public domain, okay, if it was legally fine for you to make a musical remixing those characters as they appear in the film, nobody would ever say Wicked is an adaption of the bomb books. Wicked is a prequel to the movie. We all know this, and I, to be clear, have no problem with that morally or ethically. I just think it's weird. For legal purposes, we all act like the family tree of the Oz stories looks like this. This is very clean and nice and pretty, but it does not reflect reality. The actual family tree looks a lot more like something out of Greek mythology. Maybe this is what's special about Wicked. This is a really unique thing about Wicked that through this loophole of this convoluted lineage, it's able to exist as 100% a derivative work of a copyrighted material, but we're just all gonna act like it's okay. And hooray, Adina Menzel. I've seen a lot of hype for the idea that superhero stories are our modern American mythology. And there's a lot of truth to that. I get what people are saying. But mythology and folklore are incompatible with private ownership. If there's a gate around the sandbox and somebody is standing there deciding who does and doesn't get to play in that world, it can still be a really cool world with really cool stories, but it does not function the same way that the shared universe of mythology and folktales do. The creators of Wicked, through Gregory Maguire and his work, found a hole in the fence to get at the sandbox of the Land of Oz and specifically the figure of the Wicked Witch of the West. This witch was outside the gate. Someone can use her anytime they want, but she's not going to do the job. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sure she's a great witch, but she's not a dragon. You want to tell a story about slaying dragons? You want to tell a story about good and evil? This is who you need. The play is a little less subtle than the novel in some ways, and I wanted the novel to be more ambiguous because that's the nature of how I was trying to tell my story. I wanted to pose the question, how do we know what evil is and how do we know when we see it? I wanted to pose the question, but I did not want to answer it. I wanted that answer to have to be the job of the reader. Part 2C, Good and Evil. McGuire says these themes are the reason he came to write about the Wicked Witch in the first place. What is the nature of evil? What really do I mean when I say somebody is bad, somebody is 
wicked. I wasn't really sure. Was I talking about a biological construct or a psychological aberration? Was I talking about the presence of Satan in, in a, in a post-deatistical world? What did I mean? I didn't know. So I thought, well, I'm pretty stupid, but I'm a good writer. So I'll have to write a story about evil in order to find out what I think about it now that I'm halfway through my life. That was the origin of Wicked. The fact that it was about The Wizard of Oz was just sort of happenstance. So I remembered the rubrics that say, write about what you know, and I think, what do I know? Catholic church music? <laughs> this man gets me. The only other thing I know is children's books, and there's no evil in children's books by dint of the fact that they're for children. Ha! Huh. There's no evil in children's books? There's no... Okay. And then I had my one great revelation of my life. The scales fell from my eyes as they did for St. Paul on the road to Damascus, and I saw that there are villains in children's books. And I thought, well, of course there are, and of course they're stock villains, because otherwise we couldn't hate them. He then goes on to repeat the tale of his vision of Margaret Hamilton. So, okay, there are villains in children's books, but there's no evil. I'm not sure McGuire meant to make a thing of this. I haven't found anywhere else he says anything like, there's no evil in children's books. He doesn't mention it the other times he tells this same story in basically the exact same words. Are there any evils, evil characters in children's books? And immediately, a vision of Margaret Hamilton. I don't want to suggest McGuire was trying to make some big sweeping statement about children's stories. Possibly he said something off the cuff that he doesn't even really believe. But I can't stop thinking about it. The distinction he makes in that quote feels so significant. There are villains in children's books. There are characters we hate and that we are afraid of but there isn't evil. If I'm using the word evil casually in conversation, especially as an adjective, I might call any number of characters in children's story evil. I mean, evil is in some of their names. There are evil queens and evil stepmothers. But if we're getting philosophical about things and digging into the problem of evil and the nature of evil, which is what McGuire is aiming at, I would be a little more selective about how I use the word. I don't think a robot can be evil. I might refer to a character as an evil robot, but I don't think I actually think a robot can be evil. I don't think an animal can be evil. I think only a person can be evil. If evil is a perversion of humanity, it requires humanity. Perhaps in a world of two-dimensional stock characters, of fair maidens and wicked crones, of knights and dragons, maybe there is no true evil in that world. There is just bad. Stock villains function really well as embodiments of evil, as symbols in allegories that are interested in how we respond to evil. But a symbol of a thing is not a thing. Chesterton's dragon signifies evil to us, but if I want to understand the presence of evil in the real world and wrap my brain around how it is that a person can do evil to another person, does a dragon have any use in that interrogation? Maguire names the storytelling utility of these simple stock villains and their simple stock villainy. They have to be this way, he says, otherwise we couldn't hate them. And we have to hate them, of course, to experience the emotional rise and fall that the story is trying to elicit. Children need to hate them to learn the lesson the story is teaching. We have to hate these fictional villains to rehearse our moral position against evil. But is hate a useful thing to foster in children? Is that really what we need more of? Are we really looking at today's sweet summer youth running amok in our nation's Sephoras and thinking, I'm really worried they aren't going to know how to hate somebody. My concern is that they won't know how to engage with a one-dimensional projection of their own fear and disgust. They aren't naturally out of the box going to be good enough at shutting down understanding and empathy in the face of the scary bad thing. We'd better practice. We'd better practice reaching for loathing instead of curiosity. We'd better let them know that evil only comes from monsters. Evil isn't something that just anyone is capable of doing. Evil certainly isn't something that they themselves are capable of doing. Part three, Willy Wonka is evil. Remember when this video was about Willy Wonka and how Willy became Wonka? The world first met Willy Wonka in Roald Dahl's 1964 children's novel, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But like the Wicked Witch, he is best known for his film portrayals, first and best by Gene Wilder in 1971 and Johnny Depp in 2005 
is also there. There is no shortage of listicles out there on the interwebs explaining that actually Willy Wonka is actually the real villain of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, almost as much as there are listicles explaining that Grandpa Joe is the real villain. Now, of course, however horrible you think Willy Wonka is, he objectively is not the villain of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or either of the two movies. I get the joke, I agree with the point, but to be pedantic for just a second, villain doesn't just mean a character is bad, villain refers to their role in the story and their relationship with the protagonist. Just as you can have villains who aren't truly evil, merely mean, or maybe tragically misunderstood, you can also have evil characters who aren't actually fulfilling the story role of villain. So it's playful hyperbole. It's ultimately revisionist to say that Willy Wonka is the villain in Charlie's story. But I don't think it's revisionist to say that Willy Wonka is evil. Not a joke. I think in the text of the book and both movie versions, the character as presented to us is evil. There's not a secret dark side to this beloved children's character and oh my gosh, he's actually evil. If you think about it this way, if you look at it from another perspective, like no, he's just regular evil on the page, on the screen, and everybody knows it, hence the listicles. To back up that point, I'm not sure I need to look further than the Oompa Loompa slavery. If you want to absolutely wreck your day, go ahead and look up the original descriptions and original illustrations of the Oompa Loompas in the very first edition of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, fair warning, it's very racist. And it makes it clear that this isn't Wonka treating fantasy creatures in a way that is analogous to real world chattel slavery or reminiscent of the African slave trade. Like he's just a slaveholder. Not that participating in a thinly veiled slavery metaphor wouldn't be a problem, but there's not even a veil here. In later editions of the book, and of course in all the movie versions, the Oompa Loompers are given this goofy little clown makeover, which makes the whole thing uh, both more palatable for a modern audience and simultaneously so much more grotesque. But the clown makeover does not change the substance of what's going on. We all know what's going on here. But let's say we decide to put the Oompa Loompas of it all to the side for a second, because after all, they seem fine. You know, they seem very happy. This is all very whimsical. I don't really believe you, but let's say it's fine. This is an indictment of Roald Dahl as an author who's indulging in these like horrible racist caricatures, but I'm not sure how much you can pin that on Wonka the character since in the moral universe of this book, this is fine. Wonka is still evil in basically every other interaction and relationship that we see. For example, when he invites, and this has to be emphasized, invites five children into his factory with the intention of gleefully watching them meet disaster one by one. Is this funny? Yes. Is this also evil? Unfortunately, yes. Deliberately placing them in proximity to danger, engineering situations that nudge them to do something dangerous and then making no effort to prevent or even oppose them getting hurt. And no, this is not prevention. This is a bit. These are children. Wonka. She's literally neurodivergent and a minor Wonka. Their brains are squishy. They don't have the cognitive equipment to always resist when adults are deliberately setting them up to fail. Yes, they are old enough to make good choices or bad choices. Absolutely. Children should have some accountability. And honestly, some of this is on them. But this or this. This is not their fault. Children are not responsible for identifying when trusted adults in positions of authority are trying to entrap them. The Oompa Loompas might try to frame this as a morality tale and sing about the perils of sins like being too greedy or watching too much TV or being fat or chewing gum, which are not equivalent sins, by the way. This is some pretty little liar's logic. I think the absurd lineup of personal faults represented here makes it pretty clear that the sin Wonka is interested in is not an actual, like, virtue or moral failing. It's annoying him. But even if these were all sins and they were all equivalent, we can still see that Wonka isn't teaching these kids shit. He's not helping them be better people the next time. He's not even letting them experience natural consequences. He thinks they're annoying 
and he's punishing them for being annoying. I don't think they deserve it, but even if they do, even in the versions where they are the most selfish and nasty and you can make a case that they had it coming to them, it is still evil to put children in harm's way and then be delighted when they are harmed. The squirrels aren't evil, they're just scary and bad. The chocolate river and the sucking tubes isn't evil, it's just scary and bad. Wonka is evil. Because Wonka has humanity that's been twisted. True humanity calls on us to safeguard children, to realize they are stupid and have their backs. Delighting in the harm of vulnerable people is a perversion of human instincts and the potential for human goodness and the call of community. And Wonka doesn't know anything about community. Every version of the story starts with him amassing resources and then deliberately pulling out of his community. He hoards wealth and knowledge and worst of all, chocolate. And he makes an active choice not to invest in his community, not as an individual building person-to-person -person relationships and not as an industrialist that could potentially be the center of the community economically. Wonka, you can't do that. We live in a society. You can easily take an anti-capitalist angle here and indict Wonka for his wealth hoarding purely on the basis of the inequality and the exploitation it requires, whether he is employing and underpaying people or enslaving Oompa Loompas. But even if you think of Wonka as a job creator and as an important part of that economic system, he still sucks. He's not creating jobs. Nothing's trickling anywhere. Nothing's trickling anywhere but the chocolate that killed Augustus Gloop, is that anything? The capitalist outlook that Wonka himself subscribes to gives him the responsibility of moving capital throughout his community, which he doesn't do. This is what makes him actively evil instead of maybe misguided, because whatever way you look at it, whatever paradigm you apply, he is taking on no responsibility ever. The most evil thing about Wonka to me, the most clearly evil, is not what he does, it's what he doesn't do. With all his genius and all his resources and all his endless whimsy, he does not invest socially or financially in his community. He is deeply complicit in the poverty of the Bucket family, the poverty that he supposedly saves Charlie from. And he also, like, doesn't smile at people. He doesn't maintain friendships or even acquaintances. He doesn't offer anybody support or empathy or even the simple day-to-day -day interactions that maintain a strong social fabric. He is a recluse, not because he's depressed or he's got agoraphobia or something. It's because he thinks he's better than everybody else. He just hates people. And same, People suck. I say I hate people all the time, but when I say I hate people, it's because I'm stuck behind a slow walker in the mall and I'm fantasizing about just like clocking them in the back of the head, but I don't literally have hate in my heart for all people and want to see them suffer. Wonka has such a lack of humanity that to him, other people only exist for him to exploit. And that attitude extends to Charlie too. Wonka only cares about what Charlie can do for him. That's why he gives Charlie the chocolate fact. A grown-up won't listen to me. He won't learn. He will try to do things his own way and not mine. So I have to have a child. I want a good, sensible, loving child, one to whom I can tell all my most precious sweet-making secrets while I am still alive. I'm calling the police. Again, we have that inversion of a whole good human outlook. Wonka, who has all the wealth, all the power and resources, looks at Charlie, this tiny, dumb, earnest, impoverished child, and he thinks about what Charlie can do for Wonka. Even if that doesn't mean harm for Charlie, even if, as a happy side effect, Charlie ends up better off, this is the wrong way to be. Even if nobody got hurt at the chocolate factory, this is evil. This is definitionally evil. This is a God complex. This is the cardinal sin of pride. This is a human without real humanity. This is evil. So take that, Gregory Maguire. There is evil in children's books. And in this case, it's not from a scary villain. It is not from a simple stock villain that we're supposed to hate. It is from someone we're supposed to trust, to love. Maybe I just hate Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I hadn't been considering that as a reason I'm so mad about Wonka, but I think I hate that story. I appreciate Whimsy as much, possibly more, than the next person, but 
the values of this story are wrong. Willy Wonka is a fantastic character, like deserves his place in the canon of children's characters. Uh, but a universe in which Wonka is a figure of respect and love is a morally broken universe. I think. The longer I talk about this, the more I think this is just a tragedy. Like, the end of this story where Charlie agrees to take up the mantle of the chocolate factory on Wonka's terms, that's tragic. He inherits the wealth, and he inherits the Oompa Loompas, and he inherits all these horrible lessons about how to treat people. Based on the trailers, the Wonka movie definitely seems to be positioning Wonka as a hero, which is weird and alarming to me, but shouldn't that be like Wicked? Couldn't this be a fun subversion? Or shouldn't it actually enhance Wonka's evil for us to see that he once had the potential of being good? If this is real evil, not Cruella de Vil evil, not stock villain dragon evil, but actual real world evil with all the complexity and potential for humanity that that requires, why would more backstory wreck it? Maybe I should want to see Wonka. Well, I don't and you can't make me. But there's one more thing about Willy Wonka. Wonka isn't just evil, he's chaotic evil. He's honestly maybe more chaotic than he is evil, at least in the context of Charlie's story. This is who Wonka is as a fundamental force in Charlie Bucket's world. Charlie doesn't grapple with good and evil, with a knight and a dragon. He grapples with order and chaos. Those are the forces that rule his world. In this universe, Wonka is limitless, unstoppable chaos. And if he has an overarching plan, if he has a why, it breaks the whole thing. This was already a problem in the 2005 film, which did somewhat capture Wonka's malevolence, but totally failed to capture his essential chaos. We got extended flashbacks to Wonka's sad childhood and his sweets-hating dentist father. Why Wonka cares so much about candy is not a question that should be answered because it wasn't a question and because answering it breaks the character. Gene Wilder's portrayal, if nothing else, definitely gave us a chaotic Wonka. I want to come out with a, a cane and that something's wrong with my leg. Start to fall over, then roll around, and then they all laugh and they applaud. And uh, What do you want to do that for? I said, because from that time on, no one will know whether I'm lying or telling the truth. Let chaos be chaos. Trying to make sense out of Willy Wonka would be like trying to explain why the Joker wants to watch the world burn. <laughs> now listen. I maintain that the actual film Wonka, the content of the movie, and whether or not it's good and whether or not I personally like it, is totally beside the point of this video. I was using my reaction to the idea of Wonka as a springboard to get into things I actually wanted to talk about, but it took so long to make this video that Wonka is out now and I can just see it, and it feels weird to have spent this long talking around the movie and not just watch it. So I will be watching Wonka tonight as I film this, and if you would like to hear my thoughts about the movie, movie, which might relate to what I talked about in this video or might be completely unrelated reactions, you can go see that over on my shiny new Patreon. Patrons will get early access to videos like this, as well as regular bonus content and behind the scenes looks at things that I am cooking up and will just you know, hang out. As always, I really appreciate hearing your thoughts in the comments. I'm not able to answer very many of them, but I do read a lot of them, and I am so grateful for the really generous and thoughtful comments people have left on my most recent video, the Kirsten Mega video. I feel really lucky to have had such a warm welcome on YouTube, and I can't wait to show you guys the other things I have working on, so you'll be hearing from me real soon.